Hello and welcome back to the Mixing Music Podcast. I am your host, DK, and with me is... Come on, I texted it to you. It was a great idea. Hold on. You, you gave me like three ideas. No, we already used that one. Yeah, or... It was another one. We might have to start over. Was it Lua Deepa? Uh, That's hot. Dua, Dua Lupa. Dua Lupa? Can we do that one? Or Lua... Dua Lulu. Hakalui? Hakalui. Hakalugi. 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 Uh, oh, I'll start over. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the Mixing Music Podcast. I'm your host, DK, and with me, as always, is my lovely co host, Dua Lupa. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if you're I mean, watching right now, I'm- I put on a good show then. <laughs> I'm a great performer. <laughs> And if you're watching right now on the live stream, we are live on Twitch and on YouTube. You can go to mixingmusicpodcast.com backslash live to check that out if you're interested in that. Um, but we are here right now with a very special guest all the way from, came all the way out to the LA from Melbourne, Australia, specifically for this moment and for nothing else, for nobody else, just for here. Nam also just happened to be out. happening. And... Uh, we got Nick from Panorama Mastering. Hello, yeah. Nick. Yeah. Thanks for paying for all the flights and the accommodation. Yeah. It's been such a good time to get flown out for this podcast. Did you enjoy the sushi we sent to your room? <laughs> yeah, $80. It was like, yeah. it was huge. It was oh awesome. <laughs> nice. No, just kidding. Nick has been out. We just finished up Nam. So if you're watching right now or listening, if you're watching live, we literally just finished Nam this weekend, hence why my voice is kind of shot and gone. Um, but we just had three days of NAM. Nick was out for that and is also out here visiting a bunch of other engineers and producers, just doing a lot of networking, doing a good job with all of that. Um, but Nick has a wonderful YouTube channel called Panorama Mastering. Um, and it's actually really great. In fact, uh, you told me a story where even Baines recognized you and, and for your channel and watch has watched some of your videos. It's really great. You've had um, great business advice. I think... Was it a live stream or something? I don't remember, but in one of the, or maybe it was an interview on a podcast, but um, when you were asked the question, how do you make more clients? How do you get more clients? You actually gave like a really nice answer that I really liked, although that has nothing to do with, but you're really, really good with like in-depth technical stuff um, from intermediate to advanced level stuff. So we're excited for Nick to be here. Um, go subscribe to Panorama Mastering. Um, but today the topic is compression, specifically what the hell are microdynamics and macrodynamics, and how can you utilize them to have better mixes, better sounding, uh, some better sounding tracks? So let's start it up. What the hell are microdynamics and macrodynamics, Nick? Okay, so the concept of microdynamics and macrodynamics, um, originally I saw documented from Bob Katz in his book on mastering. So microdynamics being the difference between various notes in a passage and macrodynamics being the difference in volumes between passages within a piece of music um, and how we uh, uh, approach that in our mastering approach and respect that and how it actually affects our output and the listener's experience. That's so interesting. I actually, I think like, so if you've been listening to the podcast, Braden, who's the host of the exclusive content, you can sign up, mixmusicpodcast.com backslash exclusive for three times the amount of episodes as normal. Um, but, uh, we were talking about this, like, especially like it for me as a mixer, mix bus, where it's like I got really slow compression, more meant for like chorus to verse kind of mm -hmm. dynamics versus transients. Yeah. Right. And so that's what you're talking about. Like, yep. Yep. The difference in the way you, you approach that, whether it is with a compressor automation or upward compression, a whole various. So for, for the people on the audience, what is upward compression? Let's let's go there because you mentioned that real quick. Yep. What is upward compression? So, literally, it's parallel compression. But the verbiage is a little bit different just, just because. Just because. We want to be a little bit fancier. But it, it sort of describes the process of what we're doing. So we're taking a parallel signal. We're compressing it really hard so we lose all the transient information, but we retain all the low-level detail information. So everything in the back of the mix gets retained, and then we blend that back up into it. So we're blending the low-level detail up into the mix. So moving upward compression. And I, I like that a lot, to be honest. I do love upward or parallel compression a lot. One of my favorite plugins, I know y'all want us to talk about plugins, even though we don't care that much. But <laughs> one of our favorites is um, 
is like uh, Baby Audio's I Heart New York, which is like a really simple okay. VCA compression, and it's just like a volume knob. You blend the super wet signal in, and it's just really nice. Mm -hmm. Single fader kind of thing. So tell us, how can a mixer or producer understand and utilize um, controlling or expanding or whatever uh, microdynamics and macrodynamics um, in a mix or in a song? Okay. Um, so I'll start with macrodynamics. That's like a bigger picture. It's easy to incorporate. So macrodynamics, you're playing through sections of a song. You're just considering how loud something goes into the next thing and how you can manipulate the listener's perception of it. So we've seen tricks like this before, like in EDM tracks where over the 16 bars in the pre-chorus or the eight bars before in the pre-chorus to the drop, you know, you can ride the fader down one and a half decibels and then pop it straight back up as soon as the drop hits. Simple little things like that, but being conscious of how that interacts with the listener's experience. So that, that's where you can start in a big picture, just simply volume automation. Mm -hmm. Nothing nothing crazy, you start there. Then when you go to the microdynamic detail, you know, it's it's really easy to appreciate that this in things like drums and, you know, pluck sort of synth sounds and little things that have, you know, both melodic and rhythmic information. How do you dial in your compressor? Do you, do you, is, is there a lot of space between the body and the transient? So you're going to have a little bit of a faster attack or is it that, you know, you want a little bit more energy out of it. So you're going to use a little bit slower attack and just hold down the body so you can set, create mm -hmm. a bit of separation there. So it's about listening appropriately and then, and then making decisions based on how do you want to impact that listener with that information? And nice. Yeah. Well, let me ask you how much, uh, cause in mastering, I know a lot of people are kind of worried when they say, uh, when a mastering engineer will say, oh, you know, I added a compressor. It's like, uh oh, he's changing my dynamics. He's changing my transients. How much, uh, how much do you find yourself shaping for that, but in use of compression on the masters? Like, cause, uh, we're, I know the application we speak of right now is like more in the mix. Yep. But if they were applying this to the master, if they wanted to apply it in that sense, is there an application for that? Yeah, there the definitely is. It, it really depends on what autonomy you have over the project. So if you're producing yourself and you're finding yourself leaning heavily into the compressor to bring in some bounce or some glue to the mix, which otherwise you could be doing in the mix, mm -hmm. it'd be like, don't bother using the compressor. You'll get much more cleaner results just going back into the mix to try get those levels right. Mm -hmm. Um in my position as a mastering engineer, I don't have that autonomy and agency. We, we get a stereo file, so we're going to listen to what's there. And then if things are poking out, sometimes it could be a, a snare drum that's poking out a bit hard. Mm -hmm. And then we're like, okay, well, how can we do that? Well, we use a high-pass sidechain filter, so none of the low end sort of gets there. And then, well, how fast can the compression be? And only deal with that snare. And then we mm -hmm. we, we manage it in, in that sense. Um, so, yeah, it, it really is a contextual sort of thing. So for producers, it would be... Actually, for embellishment, it can be really cool if, if you've got a faster release and then it's moving with the music. So you can do that on your mix bus, especially if you're doing like a dance track or something that's, that's got a big 808 and you want it to pump a little bit, mm -hmm. beat up the release a bit, you know, nice. get it moving. Um, and you can be creative with it as well. So because dynamics or rhythmic information is musical. Yeah. So it's almost like another component of your arrangement of your composition and how you manipulate that's really really interesting the sky's the limit especially with with dynamics processes gotcha um anything that let's say because uh you know i'll teach lessons once in a while and <laughs> when you talk about say upper compression parallel compression it's usually something that a lot of people don't really utilize until later in their career yeah. if somebody was new to this what are some of the things that you might suggest like uh the iheart new york plugin is great for this kind of stuff i know inflator does something similar but if they wanted to kind of like practice at home with it um, how would you, everybody's approach to the attack, the release, the ratio and everything for parallel is so different. What are some of the tips that kind of gave you aha moments for that? Um, so when I was starting with parallel, parallel compression, it was using the default compressor all mm -hmm. bust out manually, like, as in like soloing that, that, that bus, mm -hmm. listening to the compression. Mm -hmm. And what I'm listening for is it bringing out the things I want the parallel compression to bring out. So are those low-level details coming out? Mm -hmm. Are those transients getting ducked enough? If it is, then I'm on the right track. And it takes a bit of fiddling because all material's different. So mm -hmm. the ratio used on one track will be different to another. Same with the attack and release. But you don't need to go spending money on any fancy plugins when you're trying to learn it. Because you really, it's really important to understand the fundamentals and how that interacts with the signal. So you should know how to set up a send, get it into the bus, process that signal, 
listen to that signal, understand how, when it is actually blended in, what it's doing with the combination of those signals and what's actually happening on a digital signal processing level. So getting started on those fundamentals is what I would advise anybody to do because you it's, it's more exposed. It's uncontrolled. When you're in a plug and you've got one knob and it's just sort of guiding the show for you. But if you really want to learn and understand what's going on, start from the basics. Whatever yeah. you've got in your door will work. Now, how many times, because uh, I know typically speaking, they'll say like working with linear tools uh, when running in parallel. Uh, how much of an issue do you find that in the, when you're using it in the master? So as long as it's set, uh, like, as long as you've got um, delay compensation on mm-hmm. and everything is sampled aligned, mm-hmm. it shouldn't really be an issue. That's, okay. that's the first thing. In terms of linear phase, if you're using something like a multiband compressor, mm-hmm. um, I would only advise one. I, I know we're not going to be trying to push plugins onto people, but I, I have to mention it because it, it's the only one I would use. And it, the Leapwing Dyne one, the way they've, they've put that together is incredible. Um, I do like the Leapwing stuff. Yeah. And, you know, the whole team, they're really great. And, yeah, so in terms of linear phase or whatnot, as long as it's sample accurate – if you're going for something really colorful that's going to introduce harmonics, that's obviously going to start to change the shape of the mix quite interestingly. And sometimes that can be really cool or really bad. And it's sort of like a potluck. So my thing is, whatever the default one is, tends to be clean enough. Mm-hmm. Start start there and then you can broaden your horizons as you, as you get into it more and you start to get a feel for it. Gotcha. So when does it go wrong? When does it go wrong? Yeah. Well, when does so the compression or yeah, not work? A yeah. classic question in the world is always like, how do you know when you're done? How do you know when you've done too much? When it comes to parallel compression and upward compression, when do you, what is an obvious sign of like you're going too far with it? Uh, when you're leaning on it. So if, if you're trying to bring together a mix to bring out things in the background and you're leaning too hard into using the parallel signal or the compressor, you'll start to hear it pumping, like not in a pleasant way behind it. Then you know you've gone too far. Because if you're, mm-hmm. like I said at the start, if... If you're a producer or a mixer, mm-hmm. always go back to the mix. Yeah. As a mastering engineer, if you get a mix in that is spot on, a little bit of limiting, a little bit of EQ, and then you step away and it's spot on where it should be. Um, so you know you're doing too much then. And then it's your responsibility. If you are, um, you know, guiding through the process of a mastering session or a mastering project, whether it be for your client or for yourself, um, it's a communication job as well. Mm-hmm. So it's about going to the producer or the engineer. Hey, I've got the mix. I looked over it. I started working on it. However, it might sound a bit better if we do X, Y, Z because your parallel compressor might be pumping everything and working too hard. So knowing when to put the brakes on as well. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's very important. It's super interesting because I feel like the uses of parallel or upward or, or macro micro dynamics is different from an individual, even from like a bus level to an individual track level from like a mastering perspective as well, like uses. Um, like, for example, have anybody listening right now, you should try doing like hyper fast compression and paralleling that into a drum bus and then even like EQing it before do the hyper compression and then blending that in, which gives a totally different sound. Like if you scoop out the hyper compressed drum bus pull out all the mids. So it's mostly just tough and low. And that makes it really wonky too. And cool. All the sounds of like parallel, like heavy parallel compressed drum loops that I've heard, like all coming into my head. And like, I agree. Like it, it put a smile on my face. Cause I know the sound. I feel the sound when you're describing it. Yeah. You, yeah, you have yeah. To and try then it. there's also like, I mean, if you, in that similar example, I don't think I've ever tried this enough where like you take a really slow, like let's say just just for the sake, like a Fairchild on four, <laughs> on okay. the four time constraint setting, putting smashing the drums that really slow gluey compression and then paralleling that that totally gives a way different sound as well, and like and on vocals right so like if you were to do it on just vocals, um, upward compression is great, but remember it'll also bring up the small stuff like breaths yeah so if maybe breaths will become a little bit too pronounced as well mm-hmm. so you might want to put at least a gate before because if you do an aux so i'm trying to like visualize yep. this for the audience here if you duplicate a vocal for example then you in the inserts you can do gate first or d breath or whatever first and then smash it so it doesn't increase any breath mm-hmm. and, and then blend it in kind of a deal you that's smart that too yeah i tend to do that um usually when i'm doing parallel i'll put a de-esser first 
Main reason mm-hmm. is because the S has become too much a lot of times because, let's be honest, high frequencies don't need as much volume. So the first thing that's going to get compressed is probably your low end, and then the S's really stand out. So if you do a de and then I actually kind of like just filtering out just for the range like if i'm doing a vocal yeah uh, i like to filter out a lot and just keep like 300 hertz to like 800 hertz sometimes and that's all i was looking for out of the parallel compression yeah so here's a question because coming from a mixer and i want to ask you as a master engineer you've seen lots of different mixes from many different mixers yeah um for the purpose of getting commercially loud you know it's a mm-hmm. different different mindset if there is an issue do people we're talking about macro dynamics do mixers tend to put in too little dynamic difference between the verse and the chorus or too much has there ever been a session where it's like oh it's way too loud in the chorus versus like you know what i'm saying like how often is there a disparity between the two yeah there's not a trend for one or the other however it does happen where Two things: the verse is louder than the chorus, and that's a headache because then I mm. end up having to I, I put um, tempo markers in, chop it up, and then start to have Clip to gain to, automation yeah, type thing. Have oh. to do that, or it's um, the other way around where it's really soft, like super soft in the verses, um, and super loud in the choruses. And something really cool you can do for that is with um, really slow attack, really really slow release. So r- super slow attack, super slow release, compressing twelve dB or whatever the difference is in gain reduction during the choruses. And then if you get your threshold right, it won't do any game reduction during the verses. So what you have is almost like an automatic leveler. So you can naturally mm-hmm. level those verses back out because you're getting a doubling mm-hmm. of the signal back in. So you can control that all automatically and it breathes with the music in a really nice way. That's so, cool. um, But I will say, anybody listening right now, all y'all mixers right now, do not rely on a super slow attack and release compressor to to control dynamics with your verses and chorus or sectional dynamic. Like as a mixer, like for me, well, most depending on the song, because like on 24K, a lot of the Bruno Mars songs, the chorus was the soft bit. Yeah. But in most songs, the chorus is the loud bit, right? So you get to the chorus. Um, mixers should be paying attention to the dynamics of the verse should be softer or at least the chorus should hit harder. Yep. And then, and if it's not enough, like I've heard lots of mixes where from like rough mixes from producers where it goes from verse to chorus and there's no dynamic difference and it doesn't yeah. really feel like a, like a sectional change. Yeah. yeah. A- another thing as well is a lot of mixes and producers, I don't know why, volume automation for vocals, they're happy to do. You can automate any parameter in your plugin and you can use it really creatively to create interest. The same way a producer will use a riser or an effect or move things around, you can do the same with the stereo width on a particular element, the amount of distortion you're blending in. You can do that to, you know, when you do have a sort of verse that's a little bit sparse and not not keeping up with the energy, you can think, well, what tools do I have here? available that's like sort of already dialed in that I might give a little bit more energy or take away a little bit more in, in the chorus mm. or move between sections because most choruses aren't just 16 or 32 bars for the same thing you know they, there's usually turns in them new elements come in use it to denote sections where you're giving more energy to the listener mm. um, and that those those are really cool mixes but I can tell when somebody's sort of like dialed in a mix set everything up and there's no automation because <laughs> it's like the same vocal the same vocal reverb delay all the way through and it's like Cool. I get it for the first eight bars, but especially for like rock music or things where it's like actually recorded rather than like digitized. Because like in hip hop music, oftentimes it's not weird where the arrangement makes up for the lack of automation. For example, yep. the kick drum in the chorus is is actually a different track and a different sample. Yep. But like when it's a rock band, the only way to make the chorus louder is either to play louder or turn the faders up. Like that's that's yep. the only yeah. options, right? So yep. and and when it's real or instrumentation. The yeah, so yeah. like with, yeah, or change the total style. Like you go from finger picking to like turn yeah. on the overdrive or whatever. Yeah. But like in general, I feel like when there's real live instrumentation, there's a huge, more important need for volume automation. Yeah. yeah. Especially when the arrangement doesn't create dynamic difference to begin with. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that that's especially the case because uh, like in a good example for like that playing different at the very least is like, uh, electric guitar if you strum up and down it feels very different than just straight down strokes oh yeah mm. yeah like it sounds so aggressive but at that point you might want to make that louder if it's the same volume as the up and down strokes 
Yeah. Just because it's a whole energy difference. And if you don't automate it, it just sounds like static noise that just slightly changed. Yeah. Yeah. So so when you're talking about where we're talking about macro dynamics, I love this. I love this topic because this is something again from a, we're talking from a mastering engineer's perspective as well. But as mixers, y'all should be making dynamic sections. Um, there was a mix with the masters episode that just came out with someone. Oh, uh, with a living legend. I forgot whose name it was, who literally had an entire preview click, one of those free preview clips on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Who That's all they talked about. Like when you hit the chorus and you talked about how on his console, if you do like turn up the master bus fader, it actually like compresses more. So you get like just a little bit of gain. I know Warren Hewitt on produce like a pro he's talked mm-hmm. about in pro tools, the master bus if you put any inserts on the master bus, so not like an aux track, but an, on a an master track, mm-hmm. um, if you turn the fader up, then it'll actually compress harder. So it's it, it's it's feeding in. Yeah, it's, it's feeding uh, into uh, yeah. all the inserts. Yeah, it's post fader inserts. Yeah, so okay. which is really interesting. So that's why, like, when fading out, you might want to use an aux track versus like because you don't want to compress Lex as it's fading out. I mean, depending how the mix worked out. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's fair too. <laughs> yeah. So, but for you, um, let's see. Are there good examples of of engineers that you've seen do it right like what is good examples of people doing macro dynamics right macro dynamics good examples tracks that i've enjoyed like, yeah, the personal stories that you've really Pers- enjoyed oh uh, man you know what um how anything he's doing i'm working with him a lot but he's he's nailing his mixes and so that describe us describe the track for people who haven't listened to it or don't know wish i had my phone on me i'd, I'd give you more of a description what would be one um, like what is the emotional what's what's happening to you emotionally when you kind of listen to it it moves me you know when you play a track and then you lose you lose attention because my, my, my memory is just gone at the <laughs> moment yeah. I'm, I'm like dead after Nam. so like but anyway we've all sat we've all sat in, our, in front of our desk started playing a track where like we are going to listen intently we're going to sit here and listen intently a minute 30 comes in and guess what we're on our phone like we've lost, like it's lost us. You know what I mean? Because it wasn't seven keep- second attention span. I know, and yeah. but then there are some songs where you press play, and you're like, "Holy shit!" Like this is capturing me in. I'm enjoying this. Like like what Nico was playing last night. Um, one of those one of those tracks. One of the artists was there, and the track like I was in the room. Mm-hmm. Everybody's on their phone, and he started playing it, and I'm like, I just got so into it. I'm like. This is a good song. It has energy in the right sections. It's moving me like music should. So it's 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 not like a technical thing where it's like you must have chorus plus 3 dB verse, negative 2 dB, bridge, negative 3 dB again. Mm-hmm. It's something that as a listener, it has to take you on a journey, has to make sense. Like yeah. um, you said with the Bruno Mars record, some of the choruses were softer. It made sense. It doesn't make sense for everything, but it has to musically make sense and capture you and keep you interested. I think this is why I use that Banks song as my monitor check because uh, there's an artist named Banks who has a an album. I don't know what it's called, but the first track on it is just an intro track called Till Now. And the intro track, I think, is the best song in the entire album. And it's not even like an official track, <laughs> if that makes sense. It's just an intro to the album. But um, it starts off with just a vocal that repeats once and then it goes into like vocoder and it continues layering all the way until the end of the song. It's like these apocalyptic exploding drums that makes you think your speakers are dying, uh, which is a great experience if you haven't experienced that yet. But uh, the greatest thing about it for me is that it just dynamically builds and builds and builds, but it doesn't feel like it's getting much louder. Okay. Yeah. Nice. What? No, I, I, you yeah, know we what? both had ideas that I, we were talking yeah. about. So we looked at each other and talked like, about seven yeah, second attention yeah. spans. We're like, and don't forget. Don't forget. <laughs> yeah. Did you forget? Yeah. <laughs> no, I did not forget because um, everything we've been talking about now is super conceptual. Okay. It's like, oh, what are the differences between sections? What are the differences between notes? I actually thought of a really good example people can go listen to. Super good, but it represents good balance of microdynamics, great balance of macrodynamics, like great sectionally. Um, Dugong Jr. Is the artist Voyager? Is the track? It's on Majestic Casual. It's Dubom Junior. Dugong. Dugong. Dugon. Ooh, yeah. I like that name. Ooh, can can we talk about this? Yeah. Uh, there's many tracks that I feel like have a very good. Is there? Do you find that there's a difference between like a perceived level of microdynamics versus actual? Like it's actually like metered LUFS is not that different, but like with use of frequencies or whatever. 
it feels like it's constantly building and it's kind of done on purpose? Or is that, is honestly, like, do you need more, I don't know, more like air space dynamics? Like, is it possible to create perceived dynamics? Perceived dynamics? Yeah. Uh, there's ways you can manipulate a signal so it feels like there's more trends in information. Um, like, I've, I've seen one of the questions that have come in, uh, you know, do you, I usually get mixes with excessive amounts of compression. How do you fix excessive compression on a mix? And that would be an example where, oh, this doesn't have a lot of dynamics to work with. How can we manipulate it? Um, so something like a uh, compansion where you use a compressor with a slow, slow attack, okay? Slow attack, and then you follow that up. So it's ducking all the body, and then you follow that up with an expander. So mm. you can pull out some of those transient details from a heavily compressed mix. And you can get, you can get, so far with that, um, it won't, it won't, if something's limited beyond hell, it's got to sound messy, but if something's over compressed, you can use compansion to do that and you can manipulate what's there. That's something that for anybody that's interested, you might have to YouTube compansion. So use of compressor. You have a video. Okay. I think I do. No, I think I would. If you have Pro well, Tools. Well, if you don't, you're going to make one now. You have uh, to. I will. <laughs> I will. If you have Pro Tools, the compressor is literally named comp slash expander. Yep. So yeah. you can... Yeah. Use one as a compressor, slow attack, then use a second one as yeah. an expander. Honestly, one of my favorite tools for that, actually I have two, but the main one I use is probably Spiff. Oh, yeah. A spiff is really good at pulling out transients and not sounding too wild. Um, it can sound wild, but uh, if dialed in right, you you can usually get what you're looking for. I need you to clarify something through Spiff because sure. a few people have like um, told me about it. They're like, you should use Spiff instead of like, because I do my thing the way I do yeah, it. Yeah, we, we all have our own work way. Yeah. Is it both dynamic and frequency? Yes. Okay. It's cool. frequency dependent, so you can actually dial it into taste and you can actually dial in the intensity per frequency. It's, it's literally the opposite of soothe. Okay. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. Like literally, like, yeah. so if you inverted soothe, yeah, then yeah. That's yeah. Be. the inversion is soothe. Okay. The other one I like, uh, I don't know if you've tried from Boz, is transgressor two, uh -huh. where you can, you can use that one a lot. Yeah, you can use it like a dual side uh, EQ slash transient designer. One side uh, has EQ filters for the transient, and the other side has EQ filters for the release. So mm. you can actually shape the transient frequency dependent and shape the release frequency dependent. So you could add more punch in your low end. Like let's say the kick drum was a little bit muddy, but there's some transient there. You can boost the transient of a specific area yep. and then cut the sustain of that same area or mm. maybe below it to create a little more punch in the track without having to fully shape the sound of the track. Hmm. So I think this is a great time to take a little pause real fast and thank our sponsor. We're so grateful. For um, you. For you, Mr. Sponsor. Thank you so much to, <laughs> to, to Nick for coming through. But um, to Isotope, guess what? I, it's been, it came out Monday. Lou and I have had mm -hmm. the pre-release a little bit that we yep. weren't allowed to talk about until now. But Neutron 4 just came out for Isotope it's as well. So good. Updated Neutron. It's very interesting. And they've kind of expanded on the idea of how to mix. It's it's, mm -hmm. um, it's interesting their their approach on how they're trying to change the user interface on everything. So something to check out. If you go to isotope.com backslash mm podcast or mixingmusicpodcast.com backslash isotope, um, you'll get either 10% off any of your orders um, or get instead of a seven day trial period you get a 30 day trial period for any monthly uh monthly bundles so this is another talking about uh we were talking about upward compression earlier but if you reference back to a previous interview we did with tyler scott who is an awesome mixer um you should go back and listen to his episode he gave us one secret using isotope and upward or parallel compression he says one of the secrets, and, and he said, this is a secret, I, he's, he almost regretted saying it on the podcast, but I think that we can repeat it because he did say it. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the public He's going to regret it even more now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, uh, is in Ozone Advanced, which includes all of the vintage stuff, he says using the vintage limiter as a parallel in mm -hmm. the mix bus phase or okay. the mastering phase sounds amazing, using the vintage limiter because it's a very slow tube or analog type limiting mm -hmm. and he says he uses that to add dynamics and even automates that mm -hmm. for adding extra dynamics into sections for macro dynamics 
Um, so I love, as you know, Lou and I love Isotope products. Oh yeah, I'm uh, sure that you've used no, and come. I, a- <laughs> I love them. Okay, <laughs> his favorite is Master Rebalance. Take those 808s out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, so once again, go check out those links that I said before. Rewind if you want to go back. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Isotope, for sponsoring the show. Uh, but on on that note, let's talk a little bit more about microdynamics and what kind of balance between mixing and mastering. But let's start off with mastering. Like, um, how important is controlling microdynamics from a mastering standpoint? All right. So from before we get to controlling, it's important for listening Ooh. because you don't always have to compress. Ooh, you can don't, you say that one more time? You do not always have to Louder compress. for the You don't have back. to, you do, I can't, I don't want to swear. <laughs> you can swear, otherwise, you can do it. Otherwise do I'll it. start going off my or handle. Just start, just start I'm just going to start throwing like it. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, you don't need to compress. It's not about what, like, what do I need to do? It's what do you have to do? So listen, like listen and then go, how do I enjoy this? There are times where mixes come in because the mixing engineer, the producers have been on the same page. They've been doing the right thing by the artist. It comes in and I will not compress it. I just mm-hmm. won't. I don't have to. It's as good as it is. Mm-hmm. Why, why, why compress it? And why I'm not, there's, it, our tools are to change. Why change something that isn't broke? You know? Mm-hmm. Mm. So first listen. Mm. Okay. Then you're listening. Now let's get into some scenarios where we're going to go, what would you do? Or how would you approach it? You're listening, okay? I like to monitor quite low when I'm listening for microdynamics. And the reason being is I like to just hear how the transients are interacting with the body. You know, see what, what sort of poking out of my speakers, what not. Because when everything's cranking, everything's good, mm-hmm. okay? Drop it low. Okay, cool. You're listening. Where's the body of the track, you know? That's actually, okay, hold, that was yeah. actually really good advice, turning it down to listen mm-hmm. to yep. transients. Yeah. Yep. Now, how, low do you, how low are you talking, though? When you do it personally, like you turn it like whisper quiet or like like whisper, whisper. I'm just, just let, let's get in the zone all okay, together. Okay, okay. All together, we'll get that. in the zone. Go. Okay, it's going through. All right, you're listening. to, Let's say there's some drums. Yeah, they're, they're moving around. How are they sitting with the melody? The top line. Yeah. Okay. Top line. Come on. Yeah. yeah. All right. Oh yeah. yeah. You're listening to it, oh, and the drums are going. Come on, drums. Oh, what are you doing? Yeah. And then I'm like, oh, can't hear much of the transient oh, in the drums. Yeah. So I'm going to use a slower attack. And get get a little bit more snap out of the transient. Good, good. All right, nice. Now let's swap it up. Okay. Now let's say the drums are really squashed. So. Okay, okay. What's going on here? All right. So you know you're gonna be listening. That's what it is. You're, you're listening to the little transients. You're listening to the body, and then you're making decisions based on your compression. And then you hit the mute button. Cool. All right, now we can get back to a serious conversation. But <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what you're doing. You're not you're not going for a compressor and going, oh, I want more punch, I want this. No, you don't know what you want until you actually listen to it properly. Yeah. And then you make a decision. So yeah, I, I hope that starts to help people. You know. That was very therapeutic for me. I yeah. don't know. I don't I'm know if I've ever sure that, sang on live. I'm gonna make sure I don't usually spend time editing the dialogue, but I'm gonna edit that section really well to make it feel really like you got so can fun. you like hard pan us for that one? Yeah, yeah. I think I yeah. Will. yeah. You can like put some pads in behind and actually <laughs> produce a whole like beat for that section. <laughs> Braden can master it. <laughs> oh, that man. was so good. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. But uh that is there's so many gems out of that, including not yeah. needing to paying attention tension i love like turning the volume down for transients it's true if you want to impress your friends with your mixes the secret is to make it so loud that they can't hear your mix <laughs> that's the secret that'll yeah. always impress them <laughs> you know i always thought like you know just use an l1 limiter at like minus 50 threshold holy <laughs> distort uh but <laughs> <laughs> but for real though i think that that's really important um is that something that oftentimes because the one unique thing is I'm a mixer, so I really, well, I, I listen to other people's mixes too, but it's been mastered, right? Okay. Like, you get to listen to a lot more raw mixes yep. than I do. Yep. How often is microdynamics an issue, and, and what are the kind of the, the most common symptoms? Okay, so, so common ones, I'm, I'm going to go through them, and then if you want to pick on any ones to dissect. Let's do it. Okay. First one, super loud snares. All the mm. time, just like crack, crack. Specifically snares. Snares, like super loud snares. The next one, um, now this is frequency specific, but people will crank the subs in their kick more than they need to. So you've got this like woof in the transient. It's like, and it's not tight. 
Especially just, if it's like really late, like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one is like over compressing the vocal. So you, you like a good forward vocal is nice, but when it's super compressed and there's no difference between softer phrases and louder phrases, mm. as a mastering engineer, that's really jarring and difficult to work with. That's like mm. because I can't reautomate the vocal, I can't remove any of that compression. So those are probably the the three top ones. Would you rather have over compressed vocals or under compressed vocals? Directly compressed vocals. You know, you know, you know. There's what? always a third no, option. No, Don't you know that? No, because no, 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 this is a, no, because a lot of producers will hear this advice. You know, before you send it off for mastering, you know, boost your snare a bit because it's going to come down, or you know, add a little, add a little bit more to your drums or your vocals because it's going to get squashed back in, or less reverb because it's going to come out. No, no, no. If your mastering engineer is giving a shit about the mix coming in, they're going to be level matching it, a being it with their chain, mm -hmm. and making sure that whatever your intention is on that mix translates to that master. So you shouldn't be worrying about trying to compensate for them. If something is genuinely an issue mm. and they're concerned about it, they'll flag it with you. Yep. This is this is a huge thing that I talk about. This is this is the mixer should take the song to 100%. Yes. Exactly. Like it do not rely on the mastering engineer to take it to 100%. Like mixer should finish the song. Mastering should take it to 101%. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. so exactly. You should never, ever rely on the mastering engineer to do anything. Have, like, there's a few times where people have wanted me to master, many times where people want me to master the track. Yep. But honestly, how much of a difference and change that they want, it's more like me mixing a two track. Yep. And that's always really hard because, like, yeah. they say, I want more top end. But, like, if it's more than a couple dBs, like, I'm just guessing how much they want. You know, yep. it's, and, you shouldn't be relying on somebody else to guess what you want out of your mix. Like if you're mixing it, you should, you should do everything the way you like it. And also yeah. for anybody working with other people, like mixing for somebody, whatever mix you send out of your studio, if it leaves your studio, you need to be happy with, even if it's mix one, being the mix they decide on. Mm. Because there's mm. been times where they hear mix one and they're like, I love it. And then you can't do anything more to that because that's going to get sent off and that's done. So my thing is if anything leaves the studio, it has to be release worthy. Don't yep. send off a mix and be, uh, this is, oh, this, this kills me. People send off a mix and they're like, oh, here's mix one, but I still have to do X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. It's mm. like. Then do that and then send it yeah, to me. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. actually, you know, so, yeah. anyway, so, so I didn't so mean to let, diverge let's, let's there. Go, let's talk about the snare thing real quick. I know that you try to master things without leaving any artifacts. Try to leave yeah. it the way it is. But what are some tools that you use to kind of cut down on the sharp transients, the microdynamics hurting it the least. Okay. So the, the best form of limiting is manual limiting. So that means manual dragging, limiting. yeah, dragging the isotope audio editor, finding where the true peak is, the loudest true peaks going into the waveform, like really in like, we're talking 20, 30 samples deep. Okay. Where you can see the dots of the samples and just click gaining the channel that it's peaking on and doing it manually like that, there might be 20, 30, 50 points. It might take a little while. And it is so transparent. You can buy yourself two decibels a headroom. You won't notice it's going on. You don't have to use as much compression later on, and you can crank that shit. DK is about to go run home right now. He's not even going to upload the wait, podcast. Wait, wait, wait. Are you using... Wait, what are you using? Audio what software? RX Audio Editor. Our sponsors. RX, yeah, Our sponsors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Wait, you're, you're pulling it into like the third-party RX? Yeah, RX Audio yeah. Editor, the standalone. You drag it in. You can get your waveform values, find where the peaks are that are just too far out, and then you can zoom all the way in, all the way in, and you can manipulate that just using gain. So it's not using any compression, no attack release. You can just gain... The, the peak just you can even even essentially when got, it's not clipping it, it it's just bringing it down is it quick on rx is it faster uh, on rx because it, it, i'm thinking like what's the difference between that versus like going into pro tool zooming in and clip because some, accuracy accuracy and also sometimes they're like if i've got a hot mix they're into sample peaks so all i want to do is go between sample 500 and something thousand and 500 and something thousand and one where it's just oh, going so it's over zero accurate. and i can click on the sample like the individual one four forty eight thousandths of a second sample, and just bring that sample point down, so I got no more into sample peak there. Although I will say though, if I got to do that five hundred times in a song, no. you got to be paying me a shit ton of money. Yeah. <laughs> Put it this way: uh, if if I'm having to do it five hundred times a song, I'm better off going back to them, going, "Hey, can you bring that snare drum down?" A decibel or two. Fair. But it's uh, probably, you know, most mixes anywhere from 10 to 50 times are going to do it and they'll take me 20 minutes. I've heard, I've heard of other people going out to RX for various different things. I've never heard of that usage. 
Yeah, yeah that's, it's that's it's cool. especially useful when dealing with like live drums. If that's you're dealing cool. with like live drums that are like inconsistent sample peaks, yeah. it's like okay, cool. This one hit really, really peaked out, but the rest of them were fine. Mm. Yeah, I've never gone out. I've always just used clip gain and figured it out in that way, or, or if I go into. Any I use I, I've used clip gain before, like even after that, if 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 I'm like I miss one or whatnot. But I like using RX just because of the amount of resolution in it. It just makes my job. I've never I've never thought to do that. That's so yeah. cool. You buy yourself a lot of headroom. Yeah. All right, so let me ask you a fun question because this has happened to me before, and I know a couple other mastering guys too. You get the V1 end of session mix because they don't have access to the files anymore but they really want to release that song you have to master that song you're almost mixing the master but there's noise there's hiss uh analog on h delay was left on are you ever trying to remove the noise i know you're an rx user now are you ever trying to use rx for more than that um so i'll try and remove the noise in the intro the outro Mm -hmm. Um, or I try and remove only so much of the noise and maybe sometimes even add extra noise to the top of the tail Mm -hmm. so the fade in and fade out are longer. Mm -hmm. So when the listener press play, it sort of gradually Mm -hmm. comes into a point where they don't notice it. Because if you press play and there's noise, straight away people know. Whereas if it's... Like that. I'm not going to start singing like you guys. I would have cued you guys if I needed to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Ooh. Cool. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's, um, that's, that's how I would be doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've had to use RX for similar reasons. Apparently, uh, one client's, uh, car got broken into and his bag was stolen with the hard drive with all the masters and everything ready to send off for mixing and everything never made it to mixing. So they just had end of day CD order one and a half hour long bounce. Jesus. Yeah, they apparently like did all the skits, lined them all up, and they're like, okay, great. This is how we want the mixing engineer to do it. So just bounce one long version so we can listen to it in like one playthrough and see if it feels right. But then when the hard drive got stolen, they just had the email of that one bounce for an entire album. Oh, Was it no. at least a web? Uh, it was an MP3, and I had to do the oh, most. no. I know, I know. But I'm not going to lie. Uh, the difference I was able to make for it, it was like, like I said, mixing the master. Um, it was still a good difference, but holy crap, did it take like hours to find a way to like, okay, this was definitely an end of day bounce. It, how do I mix a two track? (laughs) Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Not fun. Um, I think, uh, as we come to a close for this episode, I want to talk about the last thing. Um, is limiting, specifically with limiting. And okay. we can even talk mm. about clipping. Um, mixers and producers mm-hmm. who often either mix into a limiter mm-hmm. or use a limiter afterwards. Yep. Well, how do you listen for limiting? Like, how do you, what do you pay attention to when, when adding limiters to a track? When I'm adding a limiter to a track, mm-hmm. um, the release time, number one. And what does that sound like? If you can try to describe that for you. For you. <laughs> like, I don't know how to do it. Like, v- v- <laughs> yeah, breathe. <laughs> <like, laughs> <sing it. laughs> uh, Q. <laughs> no, no. Um, no, you, you can feel a pump back out. So usually what I, this is, I'll tell you my whole, how I dial in my Fab Filter Prowl 2. So the attack, I, I don't want to go too far around, but I just want to get to the point of what I'm listening for. So I'll get through the process. So the attack time on Fab Filter Prowl 2 is a gate for the clipper. So if the transient is longer than the attack time, the release time is engaged. If the transient is shorter going over the threshold than the attack time, it just clips. It doesn't have a release stage. Mm. So what I do is I go, well, how, how much do I sort of want to bring this up? Is it a decibel, two decibel? What am I sort of feeling for? How much more volume do I need in this? And I have the attack set to zero and the release time arbitrary because that doesn't matter right now. But I I get the amount of sort of gain I want to get into it. So that way I know I'm only activating the limiting and the release stage. Then I listen, I dial in the attack to a point where I know, all right, this is feeling good. I mean, I I should have said the release. I dial the release to a point where I go, oh, this is feeling good. It's it's releasing well. It's not too long that, you know, each transient is starting to cut off the next one. It's not too short that it's pumping back into itself. And then I open up the attack time. Now, as I open up the attack time, I'm opening up more transient to start clipping. Okay. Mm. So as I open it up, 
you can hear it. It's it's it's, it's not like audible clipping, like it, but it's it's a different sort of compression because it's not necessarily looking ahead. It's not engaging that release stage. It's just going straight off the top. You open the attack time to as loud as you want to get it. The more you open it up, the louder the track is going to be because it's just clipping as opposed to limiting. Um, and then just open it up to a point that feels good. So I did not know that. I did not know that on yeah. limiters like the L2 that if you move the attack time, I've always wondered what that was because yeah, so I use a couple. I use a couple huh. limiters where there's an attack and release time. I understood the release time and the pumping thing. I did not realize moving the attack Nor time did I. made it clipping. Yeah, mm -hmm. I did a whole video where I'm like, oh, this is how you use the attack time, and then like a few months later, I'm like, I read an article, and then I started doing some tests and really? running it through, and I'm like, and the the tests were like little beeps. Okay, and then That's I did the so beeps cool. 50 milliseconds long. Then I set the attack time to 100 milliseconds and the release time wouldn't engage. Mm -hmm. Then I set the attack time to 25 milliseconds and the release time would engage. And I'm like, okay, what's actually going on with the waveforms? I look in and go, oh, it's soft clipping. And I go, it's a gate. It's a complete gate for that release stage. Is that specifically mm -hmm. L2? Or That's is specifically that... yeah. L2. Oh, okay, okay. So, yeah. Um, so what about like, Was it the Sound Austin? on Sound ar article that you read? Or Sorry? Was the Sound on Sound the article that you no, read? No, it was... Um, uh, it was it was another gentleman's name. I can give you guys the name. I found it. I found that info from Sound on Sound, and I, uh, that's what got me interested in the plugin. Yeah, I had yeah. I, I had to that. do like actual tests to be like, what is, what's the DSP? What is actually going on in I there? I know I know the Oxford limiter. I use that often. It yeah. has an attack time too. But yeah. I've always wondered what that meant because you wouldn't want anything going past it, right? <laughs> to yeah. be like at least theoretically for a limiter. Like yeah. While limiting, but that's so interesting. So you said just to recap, you limit it to a whatever, everything's kind of arbitrary. The settings are at the point until you get like a good dynamic control. And then you move the release first to kind of make sure that it's in time and not too pumpy or whatever. Yep. And then you, last thing is you mess with the attack time yep. to balance clipping versus limiting. Correct. And it was the Jonathan Jetta article. The Jonathan Jetta article? Yeah. Question mark. Thank you so much, Pixel yep. People, for commenting that on the stream. So yeah, you can Google right now the Jonathan Jetter J E T T E R article um, about the L2 and the attack time. That is so interesting. I've never heard of that before. I'm sure that many people get some good kicks yeah. out of that and at least be able to use it. Any other um, final advice, practical advice, or or um, thoughts that you have for mixers and producers? Um, watch the podcast every time. <laughs> just, just watch yeah. the podcast. Get Isotope. No, no, you should have Isotope. If, if you don't have Isotope in, no, no, I'm not even joking, not because it's a sponsor, but I'm being serious. You should have it in your toolkit. The RX suite at a minimum, at a very minimum, yeah. should be in your toolkit because whether you're doing vocals, vocal editing, um, mastering, mixing, it, it will come in handy. But advice, like advice that you can go home right now to start with is start with the basics, start with the fundamentals, understand how your signal flow affects a listener. So this waveform, what is it actually doing and impacting a listener and how is it doing that? Um, that's the, the, I, I mean that genuinely because we, we can get really technical on stuff, but ultimately it's zeros and ones. It's waveforms that have a million or a billion different permeations that can be possible. And it's how we understand that that will enable us to do better work as we move forward. Absolutely. So I hope that from listening to this episode, you, everybody pays a little bit more attention to macro dynamics, the dynamics between sections, and micro dynamics, um, the little pokey things when you look at a squiggly waveform. <laughs> uh, but yeah, thank you so much for joining the podcast, Nick. Um, really, really appreciate your channel for you coming through on the episode. Again, once again, um, go check out Panorama Mastering on YouTube. Um, really, really great information. If you like the stuff that you listen to today, I know that he has a lot more um, really useful and deep, deep level stuff, deep knowledge stuff, deep cut stuff. So um, yeah, I encourage you to subscribe. On that note, uh, if you're listening to the podcast, we again do exclusive content. So if you like the podcast and you want three times the amount of episodes and just like this episode, you want more technical content, more technical tips, you can go to mixingmusicpodcast.com backslash exclusive for $4 a month or $40 a year, so less than the price of a cup of coffee, you mm -hmm. can get three times the amount of content. Um, so go ahead and subscribe to that if you'd like. Um, otherwise, if you're listening, listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, leaving a five-star review does help us get discovered and does help us. We're doing super, super well as far as our analytics goes. Um, we just want, we appreciate any sort of, any sort of help, any that those that small five seconds of time helps us out a lot. And shout out to y'all that came out to us uh, at NAM. Oh, fun. yeah. 
We that had a lot cool. of people come out to us from come up to us on them. We had a little get together as well yeah. on Friday afternoon at the same booth me and you met at. Oh my god! Oh yeah, that's right. Lou and I met at the 2019 NAM in front of the in, in the Antares booth. So uh, that was kind of a little celebration. So thank you so much for listening always, and as we always say, happy mixing, my friends, and stay saucy. 